Hey guys, I'm back and it's patch day. Now, normally on this channel, this would be the day where, you know, I make a video talking about a bunch of interesting and new ways to use the recently buffed cards. But today we're not going to do that because I can say for me personally, this patch doesn't make me super excited to jump back into ranked ladder, right? And to be clear, I don't actually even hate the patch. I just don't think that the real issues are solvable with Riot's current approach to balance systems. Uh, for, for those of you guys who might have missed it, the TLDR of the patch notes, and I did a video on that, but the TLDR is that Aphelios, Victor, and Rumble will all be, you know, varying degrees of playable. They got relevant buffs. And Quicksand will give Shrima some more identity. You know, that's kind of cool. But I don't think anything else will really change. A few of the top decks might come down a little bit. But the reality is that apart from those cards I just mentioned, almost all of the rest of the buffs that we got in this balance patch pretty much won't matter at all. And it's not really because of Bandle City either. In fact, I would say that the real issue started long before Bandle City came to the game. In fact, it started almost exactly 14 months ago. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about what exactly happened back then, the issue with the balance team's current approach, and then at the end, I'll be talking about potential solutions and where I stand in all of this personally. Like, will I still be playing Legends of Runeterra two months from now? Obviously, I am going to be a little bit critical in this video because I need to dive in deep to analyze specific problems. Uh, but there's a very fine line between critical and negative, And I'm going to try very, very hard not to be negative for the sake of being negative, because obviously that doesn't help anyone. And because of some feedback I got on Reddit, this one won't be as rambly as some other talks I did in the past. I spent a lot of time organizing my thoughts for this one specifically. Uh, also, just a footnote, uh, if you mostly play Path of Champions, this video is probably not going to affect you because Path of Champions is great uh, and it's a good mode and it's going to have a really, really solid future. No shade on Path of Champions. It's it's fantastic. This video is talking about mostly ladder and hopefully this will be refreshing to some of you guys. Uh, we're not even really going to be talking about Banal City in this video. I mean, first of all, you guys already know the issues with Banal City. I've talked about it. You know, I've, everyone's talking about it on like Reddit and Mogwai's made videos. This is not a hot take. Um, Banal City is basically too good at doing too many things, biggest of which being generating cards. You all know this. Um, but secondly, Banal City is almost not really the biggest issue right now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it's something people talk about and... I want to clarify on that. Yeah, you, you might be thinking right now, well, Swim, before you said Vandal City was a problem, and now you're saying Vandal City is not a problem. So which is it, Swim? Uh, and it's a bit more complex than that. I would say that Vandal City is a symptom of a fundamental problem with a shift in the design philosophy, right? The game has been trending in a direction for a long time now. And while Bandal City certainly exemplifies many of the issues of, you know, power creep and increased card generation, it's just kind of the latest and biggest symptom of that philosophy. I mean, as Mark Rosewater famously put it, in game design, players are really good at detecting problems, but not necessarily great at coming up with solutions for them, right? You can think about it sort of like a, like a doctor-patient relationship right? You know, the patient comes in and they are able to tell the doctor where it's hurting. And the doctor then, you know, has to figure out what the problem is and how to treat it. They have to solve the symptom as well as the underlying cause, right? And that's really, really important because if you don't solve the underlying cause, then it, the problems are just going to keep happening over and over again. So the next logical step is to look deeper. So let me take you back on a trip and talk about what really changed in this game 14 months ago. Okay, but actually, before we get into the next part, I do have to quickly explain what power creep is. So, power creep is basically when in games, newer content, whether it's characters or decks or cards or whatever, newer content starts to basically outscale older content because newer content ends up being more competitive uh, over time. Right. Developers actually do this very intentionally because otherwise people won't be interested to try out new things and the game won't evolve or change. There's a common misconception that developers do this purely to sell new things, which can kind of be true, but not really. No, most mostly this is just when you as a developer want your players to play with the new thing. Like even in free games, you do this because as it turns out, as a game developer, you want your players to experience the new content that you're spending all that time making for them. So it's not just like a cash grab tactic. Power creep is a very essential part of how games work, right? 
Of course, the problem with power creep is that over enough time, older strategies can sometimes start to feel very left behind. Uh, basically, power creep is kind of a necessary evil. The problem isn't power creep per se. The problem is when that power creep goes left unchecked, right? When power creep maybe happens too fast or does so in a particularly unhealthy way, or with the developers, you know, not going back and buffing older concepts, you know, then you have a problem where the power creep kind of runs rampant and a lot of things uh, just fall off to the wayside. A lot of card games also rotate older cards out of competitive playability after a year or two, which basically allows them to not increase in power, new stuff that comes out as much. But Runeterra doesn't have that and might not really have that option. But it's no secret that I'm saying all of this because Runeterra does have a problem with power creep, specifically a, a particular kind of power creep. So with that out of the way, Let's rewind the clocks. At the start, we had six regions, Bilgewater on launch with the Rising Tides over seven, and Targon came out to make eight. At that point in time, the power level of the top decks was pretty in line, uh, which brings me to what ended up happening 14 months ago. Something kind of changed. Uh, in my opinion, this was the start of rapid acceleration of power creep and LOR, and this was the point at which they released both Aphelios as well as stress testing, which, you know, it was an innocuous enough small, small card update. But these two cards went on to dominate the meta for several months in the form of TF Fizz and various Aphelios decks, right? And after that, only to get replaced by the new Shirima decks, the Thresh Nasus, the Aurelia, uh, various Ruin Runner stuff, right? And Shreema also just slowly started to get access to cards that, even without synergy, were just insane, right? Like, Preservarium at the time was completely ridiculous. Uh, aforementioned Ruin Runner. And of course, you know, the third card that you're all thinking of, the merciless, you know, I got a, another gift for Renekton, right, Arda? Right, exactly. You know, the cards that just exist really, really powerfully in a vacuum. And then, of course, Battle comes out and pushes the same pattern even harder, even stronger new things, even better in a vacuum without synergies, even more card generation to the point where decks that even have the ability to run out of cards are no longer competitive. All decks need to not be able to run out of cards at this point. So, you know, imagine you're a returning player from a year ago and you check out the game and you try to load up your favorite deck, you know, like like Deep or an Ash deck. And you will you will get very, very shut down by current meta decks. I mean, it's not pretty, right? You know, Ash decks used to be scary in part because stuff like Trifarian Assessor drawing like two or three cards, you know, that was like a big swing play back then. And comparing it to current card generation tools, uh, in particular with Bandol, are, is, is very, very laughable, right? In fact, there's a good chance that you don't really have to imagine this situation because this or something similar has probably happened to you where you've gone in to load up an old deck, right? Maybe sometime in the last year, you tried to play uh, Callista They Who Endure or Fiora Shen, Nightfall with Diana, Jinx, Discard Aggro, you know, something like that. And it, they just can't compete. It feels really bad. But then here's the kicker. I mean, you're scrolling through the new patch notes and there's a buff to a card that you tried using many months ago and it didn't really work since then, right? But the new buff looks kind of cute. So you try again only to get reminded of how much the power level and speed of the game have changed since then, right? Like, in the last update before this one, Sundisk got buffed to basically be zero mana in Mono Stream. It was actually a really big buff, all things considered. It pulls itself out of your deck instead of having to play it at the start, which just saves you an entire mana every time, right? Uh, in the early position of the game, that's huge, right? And when this came out, a lot of people were very excited for this, right? And a lot of few people felt like Monostrema had been kind of close in the past and maybe with a big buff like this, you know, trying it out again would feel pretty good. The sad reality is that Monostrema had an even lower win rate than it did before that buff happened, after that buff happened. Specifically, the last time people had seriously tried Monostrema, which was many months before. So why, why is that? How does it have an even lower win rate? Well, when it costed one mana, the power level of the game was noticeably lower at that time, right? I'm talking about before Bandle City came out in particular, before this last expansion, right? Which again, it's not just Bandle, but all the new cards that came with Bandle. You know, when Sigil of Malice came out a year ago, this actually would have mattered, but not right now. I mean, it's kind of, I guess, like too little too late, right? It's not really going to affect anything in the 
current scene of the game, right? And every time this happens that, you know, there's a new buff to, you know, a deck like, yeah, like Monoshima or like Yasuo gets like some new tool or a slight buff that could make him a little bit better. Whenever this happens and people try it out again, the win rate of that paradoxically seems to get lower every single time, right? In the same way that the new Sundisk update didn't increase the win rate of Monoshima. And that's just because, of course, the power creep of new cards, the power level of the new cards, is happening basically faster than the rate of the old cards are able to get buffed, right? I mean, uh, in evolution, they call this the Red Queen hypothesis, right? Which is basically the idea that even if you're improving, if you are not keeping on pace with competition, functionally, you're getting weaker, right? Relative to everything else, you are getting weaker, even if compared to yourself, you're getting stronger. Does that make sense? And that's exactly what's happened with so many decks in LOR. I mean, to be blunt, a majority of the buffs that we've seen in the last year have been kind of laughable because of exactly this, because, you know, just to even be able to keep on pace with the new stuff would already require bigger buffs than like the, the little things a lot of these old cards have been getting. Um, you know, but what to make all of this, right? I said earlier, power creep was kind of necessary to some degree. So what is it about LORs? relationship with power creep that makes it kind of unhealthy in the game well for one uh, it's definitely happening a bit too fast i think that much is clear um a big one is that legends of Terror releases content asymmetrically right um because of its region release system when you release new regions and all of when you are trying to make new content powerful so people use it you end up with a problem that new regions even more so than the individual cards the new regions end up specifically very powerful and that sort of compounds the issue right because you see those new powerful cards over and over again even more so than if it was just you know a handful of unrelated cards you just see you know the new region and recently with bandle it's it was getting to the point with the recent you know nar expansion that bandle was in just a predominant amount of ladder decks uh, especially after that expansion but also the kind of card that has been power crept in legend of Terra ends up being kind of like favoring narrower sorts of strategies, right? Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, there's three properties that the new cards tend to have, right? Uh, and some of them have two or more of these properties, but three basic properties. One, they tend to be va fast tempo oriented, leading to faster games, putting pressure on the opponent, which of course limits the ability for slower strategies to exist. Uh, two, they tend to generate card value, right? They draw or generate cards, and this limits the ability for strategies that don't keep up in generation to exist. And three, a lot of them tend to be very good standalone value card. Low synergy, which of course limits the ability for a lot of high synergy concepts to exist. That's why a lot, a lot of these three kinds of decks have sort of... I'm not going to say they've gone extinct, but they have declined. Uh, so when, you know, the the slow decks, the decks that can't really keep up in generating value, as well as the decks that are relying on higher synergy, are decks that stop really existing. I mean, the aforementioned Ash and Deep, and you know, there's plenty of decks that try to do other things, but don't do exactly those kinds of those three things that end up kind of being fallen by the wayside and while the game has over a thousand cards now you know so many more cards than the 400 or so it had on launch it doesn't feel like there's a proportionate increase of viable decks you know deck archetypes that play for different conditions than there were at that point in time i mean there's definitely more ways to play the game than back then but not as many as you would expect you know with this many cards in the pool now but the reasons for that should be clear. I mean, there's just a lot of cards that can't keep up anymore, right? And it, it feels bad, particularly for players that, you know, had a stake in certain old archetypes. I mean, okay, raise your hand. If your favorite deck of all time across, you know, the last two and a half years just feels painful to play on ladder right now against the current competition. But... The final and maybe biggest problem with LOR's particular power creep is that, uh, you know, looking at these balance changes going back the last year, I personally don't think that the devs are accounting for it in the way that they should be. So as a developer, it's very important to be aware of the amount of accumulating power creep in your game for basically two major reasons. The first is that it's important to make buffs to older cards significant in order for them to be meaningful. Like I pointed out, you know, if you tally up 
the buffs that we've had in the last year, about 70 to 80% of them have not even been able to keep up with the power creep rate at the time, let alone actually like take a concept that didn't really work and make it work for the first time, right? They're mostly not even keeping up with the power creep. The second reason is that with a high amount of power creep, you need to be extra careful about unnecessary nerfs or over nerfs. Um, and that's pretty self-explanatory because, you know, uh, in a lot of cases, if you nerf or over nerf a card, like an unnecessary nerf, then, you know, because of, you know, the quick power creep of the game, then you end up in a situation where the card feels even more excessively nerfed, right? Um, whereas, you know, if your game is power creeping, a lot of minor nerfs actually might become literally unnecessary, right? There's actually been several cards in Legends of Runeterra history that have gotten nerfed in situations where maybe just like waiting an extra month would have made that card okay, right? You know, because new cards are coming out and the, those new cards would keep everything in line. Some cards didn't actually need nerfs at the time that they got nerfs. And to me, it does feel like these two reasons have been both pretty major misses across this last year of balance patches. So a big issue is I feel like the balance team has been in some way underestimating the amount of power creep in their own game when going about these changes, right? I mean, the buffs, the old cards, you know, not being able to keep up alone. And, you know, a lot of the decks that, you know, were really powerful when they actually found themselves getting nerfed. You know, you think of the decks like, you know, TF is Azir Aurelia, you know, Thresh Nasus, the Ruin Runner stuff, even kind of like the, the meta kings of their time, right? Like the, the Ophelios decks as well. These decks basically all got slapped with a simultaneous like three to six nerfs each, um, which ended up kind of killing them. I mean, when was the last time you saw one of those decks that I just mentioned, right? Like all, all of those, you know, the old meta kings have, I would say, gotten over nerfed. Now, I'm sure some of you guys are going to be like, well, those decks are, are toxic anyway, right? Good riddance. Uh, and honestly, I do think that, you know, it's, it's, I guess, better than being, you know, an oppressive tier zero deck. But I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of you guys have some of those as your favorite decks of all time, right? I mean, they they were really unique decks and they don't deserve to not exist, right? You know, we all love the the play pattern of a zero Aurelia, right? That's uh <laughs> and you know, it, it does feel like they they did get over nerfed as good as they used to be, which brings me to my next point. I would say that we don't need bigger nerfs, we need faster nerfs. Like these decks dominated for many months before getting changed at all. And then when the changes actually happened, it was abrupt and massive and permanent. These decks haven't been seen since. Now, the balance team has gone on record saying that, you know, the balance changes have to be locked in two weeks in advance to actually making it into the game is a limitation on their system, basically. And sure, that can definitely make it a bit awkward. But that doesn't account for the many months that some of these decks have, you know, these tier zero decks have stayed in the meta before getting nerfed, right? I mean, like, today's patch is nice and all, but it is frankly completely ridiculous that there's no Yordles in Arms nerf. I mean, in the patch notes, the devs explain it. Here's the quote. We work on these patches several weeks in advance, and we worked on this one earlier than usual due to our week out. Yordles and Arms wasn't seeing nearly as much play when these changes were locked, but we're watching it now, right? And basically, they're, they're saying that, you know, they know people wanted a Yordles and Arms nerf, but the stats didn't reflect it being a crazy card, you know, a few weeks ago when they locked in the patch. And to me... I, I don't think that's a that's a real reason in this case. I mean, Yordles and Arms has been pretty much the best deck in the game for like four months straight at this point. And it should be very easy to, you know, look at the NAR expansion and realize that, you know, some of those new tools and Bandle cards that were coming out will basically only make archetypes like Yordles and Arms even stronger, right? Like this, this was something that was very predictable, right? And that to me says that the balance team is definitely over focused on the the stat like the, the the data and what's reflected in you know the the play rates and the win rates and the other metrics they look at right it, it feels like the team is almost completely driven by that data and you know obviously looking through the stats is a great tool but if you over rely on it you lose the ability to be able to anticipate what's going to happen 
you know, before these metas actually get there, which is especially important if the system limitation does actually force, you know, these patch notes to be decided more than two weeks in advance, that can be mitigated with, you know, foresight, a le less reliance on data and being able to anticipate what's going to happen. Because, I mean, there's... <laughs> When the entire community can see some problems coming before the balance team seems to be able to, there's a problem, right? That being said, uh, the other card that also got mentioned that didn't get changed was Banaltree. Uh, a lot of you guys are saying, you know, you wish Banaltree had gotten nerfed. And I will say to the devs credit, I'm perfectly happy with the change to Banaltree not coming through yet. Uh, the devs mentioned that they wanted to give it time and figure out a good solution. And this is something that I've talked with uh, several people on the balance team about, which is the idea that the philosophy is they would rather have uh, no solution than a bad solution, like a, a postponed solution. They want the time to figure out the right solution and instead of just doing like a knee jerk thing. And I think that makes a lot of sense in the case of something like Banal Tree, right? Like that's perfect um, for Yordles and Arms. A lot less so because Yordles and Arms is going to require basically they're either going to make it cost plus one mana or they're going to make it, you know, plus one uh, region to trigger its ability. Um, and that's pretty much it. Right. And it, that could have happened months ago for Banal Tree in particular. There's so many different ways and so many different angles they could look to rework or reframe the card. And in reality, I'll reiterate, I, I, I think in a lot of cases, a bad solution is worse than no solution you want to make sure you get the right rework so that it's having you know the, the deck is working the way you want it to and all the pieces are coming together right because in a lot of cases a bad solution can you know if you go for a sort of half-hearted solution it will limit what you do in the future right you, you'll kind of be building around an imperfect solution with every decision you make in the future and it will kind of block you from doing the real thing that the archetype wants to do, right? Because you've implemented a, you know, a bad solution. This is actually, this, this philosophy is actually the entire reason that I don't really like Minimorph as a card. Um, Minimorph is, you know, it's, it's a card we talk about and it's not like holding back the meta or anything right now, but I think it is holding back effectively what I would consider to be a good solution, right? Uh, when, when you think about it, like Minimorph is designed to be a solution to cards like Lee Sin, cards like Scion, cards like, you know, like anything that could carry away. It's supposed to be like a, a, a way to stop threats that are otherwise unstoppable. Right. And I would say I think that's a bad solution um, in part. That's because it, it, it's a very imperfect solution. Cards like that are going to run rampant and it turns a lot of things into, you know, like uh kind of like polarizing like rock versus do you have it or do you not go fish in, in a lot of cases or like you know do you queue into the bad matchup with a counter card or not um which is not what you want um but because minimorph is their solution to cards like that it's kind of stopping them from having a better solution which in my opinion would be kind of a nerf to those cards directly but that's just another example of the idea of a bad solution being kind of worse than no solution right like having a stopgap is good but when the the bad solution is basically precluding you from looking for a better solution then it's worse than nothing at all so i'm very happy about banal tree not a problem anyway speaking of solutions that leads really well into my next point because you know we're going to talk about solutions to, to all these so you know what i mean what are the solutions well there's no simple short-term solution i mean these aren't problems that get fixed by you know a handful of specific nerfs or buffs these are these are not symptom level issues that I'm talking about in these videos, uh, in, in this video. These are system level issues, right? They're deeper, right? So it's not something that you can just kind of like easily fix. Um, I would say one thing would be to definitely change the approach to balance. This can be done in a lot of ways. Uh, I am very confident that there is an over reliance on stats uh, and like what the data is favoring in terms of like, you know, how the decks are performing and how, you know, uh, the stat, when, when I say stats, they go far beyond like win rate, by the way. Um, I don't know exactly Riot's process, but they're not looking at like mobilitic stats, right? They have a lot of stats. If their system is robust, they're even looking at, for example, stuff like the rate at which a player will close the game after queuing into a specific deck, right? Like weird metrics like that that are important, but aren't literally play rate or win rate, right? They're looking at a lot of stats, right? if they're taking the approach well. 
That being said, there is still a limit to what stats can do as a developer, right? Especially when you have this system that apparently, you know, forces changes to be submitted two or three weeks ahead of time. That makes an over-reliance on stats even worse because that means that you can't be proactive and get ahead of issues and you're always playing catch up with these balance patches which is exactly what we've been seeing for the last year right we like every single time you know there it, it feels like it's always a game of catch up right it feels like they're always like a month behind the culprit and it feels like by the time that is solved there's kind of a new problem coming out right which is is a shame because you know things would feel a lot better if there was just like a faster response time right and i don't know the exact specifics of you know the the the, the two or week uh, two two or three week limitation uh, the the system limitation that they have to lock in in advance but it definitely feels like i mean there there has to be better ways to work around that right because it, it it doesn't feel like that has really been done and the second thing that i talked about in this video was of course you know the power creep and old things feeling left behinds uh the biggest thing that needs to happen for sure is i think the developers need to be kind of like more aware uh honestly of the amount of power creep in the game it's not a problem but it just needs to be kind of like built around and managed right what that means is when they buff like old cards that haven't been good ever or haven't been good in a very long time the buffs need to be more substantial right or in some cases maybe reworks right what that means is some old archetypes uh you know that haven't worked in a while uh definitely could get new cards as well and that would be something that would have to like they, they'd have to change the sequence of cards being added because i know a lot of cards are like designed too far in advance um and i think that's a pretty big problem because so here's an example um you know deep phenomenal archetype everyone everyone loves deep like i said you don't really see it anymore which is kind of sad um but it's we like one of the most beloved archetypes in the game everybody loved it uh when it came out it had like a crazy play rate uh and it's really cool and unique uh and it kind of sucked for a while but after a bit the devs came back to it and they in a one-off random random card they added sea scarab and sea scarab that eh, wasn't graded at the time it was a one two but they buffed it to a two three and in doing so in adding this two three sea scarab as a card deep suddenly was able to make a lot of sense for many months you know they came back to deep they gave it one card basically i mean they also gave it slaughter Ox, but we don't talk about that um they gave it one card and single-handedly that was able to take a very underwhelming archetype and make it great for months i mean solid right uh and you know it's been outclassed by this point but more of that kind of thing more sea scarabs more taking an older archetype just just adding one card and it would have to be a pretty powerful card i mean sea scarab is kind of nuts intentionally so but more of that kind of thing taking old archetypes giving them single card uh you know larger buffs or like single power cards that can help tie things together would be able to do so much in terms of long-term and new viability with a very small amount of things that have to be put into that right because that's just the problem a lot of these older archetypes feel literally forgotten about like when you look at something like tom soraka right tom soraka is also an archetype that's really fallen off you know it'll still see some tournament play because it has some unique matchup tables but on ladder it's it's done only more poorly and more poorly as time goes on and a large part of that is because not only has it not really gotten real buffs they haven't gotten a new card basically since it came out right and when you look at a lot of these that i mean ash decks as well basically haven't really gotten a new card since then right like when you look at a lot of these old archetypes they pretty much haven't gotten you know a single new card that is supposed to support them directly right you know like obviously yasuo gets like a stun here and then but he doesn't really need stuns as much as he needs you know more stun synergies or more game enders right things that will directly support these archetypes it feels like there's so many of these archetypes that the devs have basically forgotten about when it would be simple to take you know these single cards and give them big boosts you know you look at even like the shen archetype you know units that gain value out of barriers that you know recently we get the shen bow buff that happened in just today's patch but we haven't gotten you know a new card that is really trying to help that archetype i mean 
I guess there's the Shen boat, but it's it's an eight mana draw champion, or sorry, seven mana draw champion, which isn't really doing a lot to support the barrier archetype, right? It's not really trying to be a power card or really change the way the archetype's played or, or give it anything it needed, if that makes sense. And now, I mean, the good news is that we know that the dev team is planning on going back and doing something like exactly this. They announced that I believe it is in the Path of Champions, the big expansion that's going to be coming. They said it was probably going to happen in May. And in this big expansion, they would go back and buff or rework a lot of the old champions or maybe the champion archetypes in the game. And hopefully, hopefully this, this will be able to do a lot of these things that I'm talking about, right? But I think it's really, really important that you know the, these are done with the current power level of the game in mind because honestly i mean looking at a lot of these balance patches that have happened not a lot of these have been close to successful in terms of actually like promoting new viability in this current game right and that's a big problem so for me i think that's going to be a really big deal that's going to be something i look out for and i am very very hopeful that this large scale like old champion rework will be able to you know make waves and help bring a lot of these old archetypes back and you know make things you know able to be played that haven't seen play in over a year and lastly I and mean, where does that leave me right well i'm probably not going to be doing the ranked deck building that i'm normally known for or updating my site tier list because I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really big on these balance, these kinds of balance patches or the expansions that don't really allow for a lot of new things to do, right? Uh, I mean, I've been enjoying these challenge runs that I've been doing. A lot of you guys have said that you really love the, uh, the fast, uh, slow and burst challenge that we did. That was a lot of fun. And there's uh, also a new one, the uh, solo carry challenge, which I expect I'll have a lot of fun with some of you guys from watching my daily Twitch streams over at twitch.tv slash swimstream are already familiar with it, but it's not on YouTube yet. Look for it in the coming days. Those are going to be a lot of fun too, you know? Uh, and, you know, maybe I'll play some Path of Champions. But uh, apart from that, you know, until the May expansion, I'll probably be mostly playing Teamfight Tactics or other games. Um, and then, you know, when that big May expansion comes out with Jin and the new Path of Champions and the other Rune Terra Champions and you know all of these big champion reworks. You know that I'll I'll check that out and I'm I'm hopeful. But honestly, I mean if these reworks don't step up their game compared to the balance patches that we've had, not just this balance patch, but honestly going back a long time, you know, if if they don't address the things that I talked about in this video, I might just keep playing TFT after that. Because, I don't know, it just kind of sucks not being able to have as many options, fe feeling like you're just so restricted in what you're able to play or what you're able to do. But anyway, I mean, I, I hope I'm, you know, wrong. I hope I'm just being, you know, unnecessarily pessimistic and months from now we'll be able to, you know, look at a, a great expansion and laugh at, you know, the dark time that that's now over. You know, that'd be amazing. Like, it would be it'd be great, you know, if that came out in the reworks uh, to the to the old archetypes and old champions, you know, showed me that the team is changing how they're approaching the balance in these ways. But either way, these have been my thoughts on, you know, all of this stuff that I've been thinking about lately. Thanks for watching all the way through. I think a lot of you guys have been feeling a lot of the same way about these things. And I hope that I was able to at least put into good words to be able to kind of like explain those feelings. And if you're watching this video when it's premiering on YouTube, then my Twitch stream is actually starting right now as as you're watching that's right it's literally right now if you're watching the premiere head over to twitch.tv slash swimstream come say hi feel free to ask me any questions about any of this or my my thoughts or feelings of any of this i'll see you guys there and otherwise take care everyone